Two weeks ago, polar expedition left Cape Town for Antarctica. Led by legendary explorer Sir Ranulph Fiennes, it will attempt to cross the continent in winter. Today should see the ship having just arrived at Crow Bay, its destination and unloading point. With winter temperatures ranging between minus 20 and minus 90 degrees Celsius, Antarctica is an inhospitable place. Sir Ranulph says it's uncomfortably cold. Well, a fridge is minus 17. I'm, I'm not quite sure about a deep freeze, colder than that, yeah. No, we're double, double that. And that's without a wind. You get a wind and everything is really bad. Regarded by the Guinness Book of Records as the world's greatest living explorer, Sir Ranulph's latest Antarctic adventure is known as the coldest journey. If successful, it will set another record. This would be the first crossing of the Antarctic in a polar winter. Sir Ranulph actually grew up in the Cape Town suburb of Constantia until he was 12, when he moved to England with his mother. 56 adventurous years later, and his current expedition almost didn't happen. The British Foreign Office had, until recently, refused him permission to do it. Any government won't let their citizens go down to Antarctica and muck around in winter time, because there is no rescue facility in winter. But rapid improvements in technology saw to it that Sir Ranulph's adventure finally got the go-ahead. It had been sponsored a vessel, the S.A. Gullis, and all sorts of equipment, with entertainment to boot. They even got the royal nod from Prince Charles, the expedition patron, and actress Joanna Lumley, as they left London for Cape Town and Antarctica. Prince Charles had 30 years previously performed a similar function, and given Ranulph finds his blessing when he embarked on a 52,000-mile odyssey around the planet, including both poles. It is an extraordinary adventure, and in my opinion, gloriously and refreshingly mad. The Agulhas docked in Cape Town to collect essential crew and cadets from the South African Merchant Navy. While the cadets prepared for the experience of a lifetime, Fines and his crew wrapped up the last-minute details before their departure. This is not a lightweight expedition. Using these massive sleds, two polar tractors will carry three shipping containers, all in all 80 tons of fuel, food and supplies. Expedition co-leader Anton Bowring first met Ranoff when helping to organize their 1979 adventure. He says the technology that has made this trip possible is a bit on the heavy side. The whole uh, train with the caterpillars at the front, the sledges, accommodation, stores, there's another container in the hold which is for stores, uh, and the fuel scoots uh, make up the 80 tons which each caterpillar is pulling uh, and is about uh, 70 meters long. Is it fair to say that the success of this expedition is largely dependent on those caterpillars. Very much so, yeah. The expedition is faced with a number of unknowns. One of them is whether or not the caterpillars, seen here being tested in Sweden, can operate in such extreme temperatures. We are to some extent relying on uh, technical know-how and, uh, and, and good luck. <laughs> so you cannot test these machines um, at the temperatures that they will experience in Antarctica? Uh, well, minus 50, they've been used up in the, in the Canadian Arctic. But minus 70 is a different, different ball game altogether. That we haven't been able to test them for, but we've planned it very thoroughly. Thoroughness was a quality displayed by Sir Ranulph when he once cut off his own frostbitten fingers with a saw. So, I haven't lost the whole lot sort of thing. But while hand warmers might have prevented the frostbite, he says this time they're using pretty much every device known to mankind to help them succeed in their quest. You've got to keep charging whatever it is. And if you're charging it, um, you need solar charging. There is no sun. So we've reverted to what we used 30 years ago to charge the radio batteries, which is a hand crank on your knee inside the tent. But the human factor is equally important. The well-being of the team is in the hands of polar veteran and gastroenterologist Dr. Mike Stroud. He first dreamed up this expedition and is one of a handful to have spent time in the Antarctic in winter. I went on a, a, one of the only winter trips ever made in Antarctica. Mike Stroud has completed five North Pole expeditions. In 1992, walking with Sir Ranulph, he made the first unsupported crossing of the Antarctic, 
and he's one of a very few men to have lived for a month at temperatures of minus 68 degrees. Your hands and feet are, are the real deal. They, they go so quickly. And uh, it's getting away uh, in the morning and packing up in the evening because you can't do up knots or, or uh, do up buckles with three, four sets of gloves on. So living there is hard, yet a number of projects and research studies are being carried out on this trip. Mike is conducting a study called the White Mars Project on behalf of the European Space Agency, which simulates anticipated conditions on Mars. Life aboard the SA Agullas is fairly tight to say the very least. But can you imagine six guys in a shipping container for six months with no place to hide? So you've got uh, some people who are going to be shut inside a small metal box uh, for a fair amount of time. No day-night cycle, uh, rather low oxygen levels. It's akin to people being put in a spacecraft in a dodgy and difficult situation for a long time. If they want to get away from each other after, a, well, we'd be there for a year together, um, they will go outside, minus 70, they might come back in quite quick. There have been huts where there's been a white line painted across the hut uh, with a group of individuals saying, this is our half, that's your half. That's happened. Experimental it may be, yet Sir Renolf will, by all accounts, be prepared. If anyone can do this, he'll do it. Uh, he's a very single-minded, very uh, determined person. Yet if anything does go seriously wrong, there's no helicopter airlift, literally no way out. Sitting out the winter is apparently not an option. In which case, you die because you can't carry enough food. This explorer famously doesn't like to think too hard about his expeditions. What he will be thinking about are the various projects he's been entrusted with. One that's very close to finds is the charity Seeing is Believing, for which he's hoping to raise 10 million US dollars. For someone who's been snow blind for 10 days, getting involved was easy. It was just the most uh, horrible mental thing to think I wouldn't ever be able to see again. The money this expedition raises will change the lives of people in the developing world forever. In the same fashion, the South African businessman who helped organize the trip will have helped Sir Ranulf create history. Sir Ranulf's expedition encapsulates entrepreneurialism. It is at the core a, not only about self-determination, but raising funds against all odds. This entire expedition relies upon the benefit to be derived from various sponsorships. So we have the curious marriage of an Antarctic adventure and business, but Eddie doesn't see them as so different. Whether calculated or not, it's all about risk. In as much as there may have been a lot of research and development going to the equipment, until it is actually tested in the true conditions of the Antarctic, that risk and its mitigation will never be known. As for Sir Renolf, with a new wife and young daughter, what about dropping the risk and taking it easy? Uh, I find that quite frightening. Um, yeah, and you know, if you start doing things like golf or fishing, you know, that's a quick way to the grave.